until September, United Way Suncoast has a beautiful display inside the community case at the Tampa Bay History Center. And it's all about when we started in 1924. But what's really interesting is that the Tampa Bay History Center has not one, but two exhibits about what life was like in Tampa in the 1920s. Here to tell us more is the Tampa Bay History Center's Rodney Kite Powell. Rodney, welcome to Suncoast Snapshot. Hey, hey thanks, Ernest. Great to be here. Well, listen, I wanted to start by just asking you to describe what life was like in the 1920s in Tampa Bay. Well, the 1920s and in, in, in Tampa Bay and in Florida in general, um, your experience largely depended on who you were. Uh, there was a, a land boom that was going on. So there were a lot of people who were making money, but almost all of those people were, of course, would have been, been white. Uh, but a lot of them not even from here. Uh, the growth in Florida was tremendous at that time, and the Tampa Bay area um, was no, uh, no exception. So just like how the city and state are growing tremendously here in the 2020s, uh, there oh. was that growth going on in the 1920s, but at the same time, there, you know, segregation was really entrenched. The Jim Crow laws uh, and traditions were really, really entrenched. So there was very much a racial divide uh, throughout the South and really even in the North in the 1920s, honestly. Um, but since we're talking about Florida and, and the Tampa Bay area, uh, very entrenched color lines here. So uh, separate and unequal facilities education, mm -hmm. uh, shopping opportunities, recreation opportunities, you know, for, for, for most black residents. And in Tampa has kind of an, an extra level of, of that with the Cuban population, the cigar industry, uh, they were often lumped into that discriminatory uh, um, uh, kind of world as well. Um, the very limited options, uh, no parks available, no recreational swimming spaces available, um, limited options for shopping. Um, but there also, you know, were these success stories. Uh, there was a black business district in Tampa and actually in St. Petersburg as well. Nice. Uh, for Tampa's Cubans, there were really two different places. There was Ybor City and there was West Tampa. In 1924 and going back 100 years, the city of West Tampa was still independent from the city of Tampa. And it was in the top 10 largest cities in the state, believe it or not. Um, so in, in a largely Cuban population. So there, there were these places like in Central Avenue, uh, in Tampa, you know, the 22nd Street area in, in, in St. Pete. Uh, there were great economic opportunities, but they were just, again, separate and, again, very much unequal. Yeah, interesting. So, Roddy, you know United Way Suncoast traces its uh, origin back to the founding of the Tampa Welfare League in 1924. Uh, what can you tell us about the origins of the Tampa Welfare League uh, in, in this separate but equal period for Tampa? Mm -hmm. Well, so during during the early 1920s and even the late 19-teens, there were a lot of different charities, um, kind of both white and black and then some Latin in Tampa, uh, that were all vying for a limited pool of charitable donations. And so oftentimes the same uh, businessmen in Tampa were, uh, were being asked for kind of literally 25 cents for this charity, 10 cents for that charity, 50 cents for this one. And it happened kind of all year long. And so I think partly out of uh, philanthropy, but I think there's also a level of, you know, partly out of you know, some frustration and just trying to make everything um, even and equal and, and not be kind of constantly bombarded with requests. Um, the um, kind of business elite came together with, a number of the most notable charities uh, in, in Tampa uh, to create the welfare board so they could have one umbrella organization where the kind of one big ask is made every year. And that ask would be made early in the year as well. Uh, so the budgets for the organizations could be set. They would know what kind of money they have to spend. Because that's the other thing is they're always, you know, they're always looking for kind of literally nickels and dimes at the time. Yeah, hey, and, we're still looking for nickels and dimes, but that's know, okay. Right? I know, but um, but but back then that actually meant something, nickels and dimes. Yeah, uh, but you didn't know what your budget was, so you didn't know the level of giving that you could then provide to the community. So it was really important to to establish a, a welfare league, uh, and that was something you know, I think Tampa's was the first in the state, but 
but there were a few of these that were being established across the country. And so again, the business leadership and the kind of local philanthropists and the local charities were seeing this, this kind of new idea, this new innovation in charitable giving and in the operations of, of, of charities was beginning to take hold in the country. And so I think it's, you know, a, a it's not insignificant that the people of Tampa took the lead as far as Floridians to establish that that uh, framework uh, here in Tampa. You know, Rodney, I'm wearing my 1920s fedora to to be uh, fitting with our topic today, and I and I want to tip my hat uh, <laughs> to Ruth W. Atkinson, the first executive director of the Tampa Welfare League. How impressed should we be that Miss Atkinson? was the first leader of this fledgling organization in a time where women didn't hold a lot of leadership positions. I think we should be very impressed with, with Ruth Atkinson. And I'm kind of ashamed to say I'd never heard of her um, before you and I uh, kind of talked about her as, as you, you were doing planning for your program that you had mm -hmm. here at the History Center. Um, but kind of diving in and doing some research on her, she is really a remarkable woman. And you're absolutely right. Um, she was the what they call the executive secretary, but basically the same thing as, as the executive director of that welfare league. And uh, unusual to have a woman in that role, um, not that women weren't active in charitable organizations, because they absolutely were. I mean, there was kind of this kind of crass term now, women's work, but that that was something that was was seen often as women's work. The, um, going back even to the the 19th century, uh, the, the emergency hospital that was here that predated almost every other hospital was operated by a group of women. The children's home had a lot of women involved, um, mm -hmm. so kind of club women. Uh, but they came almost entirely from uh, the uh, kind of the, the wealthy, kind of wealthy individuals uh, because their husbands, again, didn't, at a time when, when women generally didn't work outside the home, their husbands were the executives and the, the lawyers and, and doctors and things. So they made enough money that these women hired other women, almost always African-American women, to do the work around the house. So they had time where most other women wouldn't have time. But Ruth is different. Again, this is the 1920s, so you're getting a little bit away from that, but not really too much. But she was a, a, a professional. She, she did this as a job. Uh, her husband, nothing against him, but he was a, he was a house painter. Um, yeah. So he wasn't like he was some really established person, you know, working at you know, First National Bank or, you know, working at uh, a major law firm. So she did it, you know, one as a job, but certainly she cared very much about the welfare of others. And, and you can look at that from her previous work with the Red Cross here in Tampa. And, uh, and so she was a, I think, a natural leader. The only other woman who would have probably been up for a job like that would not have really been looked at for that job because she was African-American and that would have been Blanche Armwood. Right. Uh, she was uh, the executive secretary, again, the executive director in our terms of the Urban League in Tampa. And, and, and she, although she came from a wealthy family, so she, um, you know, not that she didn't have to work, but she, the Armwood family is a very established family here. Um, but, uh, but she was the only other woman who I think would have been tapped for that kind of job, but because she was black, she, she wouldn't have been. So, so it's very logical that they would have uh, uh, hired Ruth to, to run the welfare league. Um, but then she eventually worked uh, for the state, for the state welfare board. And so she kind of carried her talents uh, from Tampa and took them to Tallahassee and, uh, and did a very similar job uh, on a much, much bigger scale. Yeah, you, you know, we, Rodney, we really consider her a pioneer, and uh, we love the fact that uh, she worked closely with Blanche Armwood and, mm -hmm. and was outspoken in support of the African American community. So, uh, uh, and then the Urban League was one of those charities that was brought on board. So again, it was right. there. There, there was a an understanding among the larger white community that that the black community was deserving of of aid. Um, again. You can look at the terms and look at all the other things that were going horribly wrong at the time, including the lynchings, literally. Um, but the, but the Urban League was one of those organizations, and, and Blanche Armour herself, seen as one of those people who was an, an important person and somebody who who needed to be brought into the fold. Yes, yes. Well, listen, Rodney, as we wrap up, just kind of quickly, 
talk about the history centers. Um, uh, uh, just talk a little bit about the history centers' willingness to allow <laughs> different nonprofits to display their history and mission in what you guys call the community case. Yeah, so we, we we're really happy with with how the community case has worked out over the, the years. As we were designing the, the history center um, back in the early 2000s and mid 2000s, um, before we opened in 2009, uh, we were kind of struggling with the way to make sure the community could feel involved, you know, almost on a daily basis with the history center. You know, museums are a community gathering space. We are a place where uh, we, of course, we of course want to celebrate. Our, our history and the positives, but we don't want to ignore the negatives. And, and you know, history is full of ups and downs, um, but it's oftentimes the nonprofit organizations in our community that are really doing the, the, the work to, to make this place a, a, a better place. So we wanted to be able to highlight those organizations. And so we have the community case on the third floor in our permanent galleries. And, uh, you know, it is made purposefully, you know, expressly for places like your entities like United Way and others who really have such an amazing and important impact on our community. It's our way to help organizations like the United Way showcase their history. Um, because it's one thing for people to understand what, you know, what an organization does today and it's very important, but to know that they've been doing it for so long, you know, a hundred years in, in your case, yes. helping the community uh, really being a, an important part of the community. I think it, one, from a donation standpoint, can, can show people that there's a lot of stability, that it's an organization that can be counted on to be here tomorrow because it was here for so many yesterdays. And so I, I, I think um, that in a way, kind of unintended consequence, but I think that that certainly helps that. But we just really want people to understand that we have a long, rich history and that uh, the nonprofits of the world, as we are one, are a really important part of that. I so appreciate that, Rodney. Listen, thanks so much for taking out time to join us today. Um, as we close, I want to be sure to thank the marketing communications team that helped put the community case together, creative director Don Pataro, social media manager Nicole McIntyre, uh, senior marketing manager Devin Enlick, senior administrative specialist Daria Harrison, and marketing specialist Nicole Evers. They all did a great job in contributing to the case. And we are so grateful, Rodney, that we have this opportunity. So thank you for that. Oh, and boy. as always, remember, united we rise. United we win. Yes, Rodney.